the simplest way to manage surplus energy and why I had initially advised my customers against this method, the various challenges and issues I've been confronted with so many times regarding it, and ultimately, why there is now a happy resolution to this issue, despite the difficulties we've faced along the way. And with that, I'd like to warmly welcome you once again to another video on this YouTube channel, where we cover these important topics. I have to be really honest with you all, something like this has never happened to me before. I started preparing to make a video where I was going to explain to my community why a specific function on the Solax X3 hybrid inverter is practically useless, because I've personally encountered issues with it myself. Many customers have confronted me with this exact same issue, and some have even blamed me for recommending this solution back when honestly I didn't have all the necessary details or a full understanding of the situation. Unfortunately, this lack of information caused issues later on. I repeatedly raised this issue with Solax China, bringing it to their attention over and over again. And while they did acknowledge the problem and even thank me for pointing it out, the issue continued to persist for quite a long period of time before it was finally fully addressed and resolved. So, I had originally made the decision to create this video to not only explain to you, but also to clearly show you why you can forget about this particular function entirely and how you can solve the issue even more effectively with a better alternative method. My initial plan was to first clearly show you the entire problem and then demonstrate exactly what this issue involves step by step so that you could understand what's going on in detail. Once again, I ended up spending hours upon hours attempting to recreate this error or reproduce the issue, something that has already cost me so much frustration and led to endless explanations to my customers, subscribers, and channel members. But this time around, I couldn't manage to trigger the problem at all, no matter how hard I tried. So, I sat down at my computer, opened up WeChat, which, by the way, is pretty much like WhatsApp, but mainly used in China, then I opened up the Team Alex slash Solax group and decided to write a message to see if I could get some clarity on what was happening. I typed, Hi guys, why am I no longer able to reproduce the error with that function we all know is completely useless? What's going on with this? Why is it not happening anymore? They responded with, Because we fixed it. Smiling face with smiling eyes. That smiley face really got to me. All right. I had to change my entire plan, but I'm still making the video anyway. If you're curious about what this is all about and what function I'm referring to, stay tuned until the end. It's going to be interesting as always, and don't forget to take a moment during the intro to scroll down, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and turn on the notification bell. I'm Alex. Let's get started. I honestly can't even begin to tell you how many times I've been confronted with this exact issue. I keep hearing the same thing. Hey Alex, every single evening when I'm in the kitchen and I've just finished cooking, my battery is already down to around 40%, and yet my boiler still turns on. And this happens even though I've set up the dry contact settings exactly the way you explained and told me to do. Why does it keep happening? Or... Hi, Alex. I'm really not happy with the surplus control method you recommended because every time I turn off the vacuum cleaner, the heating rod in my buffer tank turns on, even though there's no surplus available at all. In fact, I'm drawing power from the battery instead. Or a special shout out to Werner. Alex, the relay you suggested to me just isn't working. Every single time my Tesla gets fully charged, two hours later, my boiler starts boiling water and my entire battery is completely drained. How is that even possible? How can that be happening? Everyone who encountered this particular issue had been relying on the most basic method of surplus control, which in this case involves using the potential free contact of the Solax X3G4 hybrid inverter. This approach allows the contact to either open or close based on the specific criteria defined within the dry contact settings. Setting this up is relatively simple and straightforward. First, I take pin 3 from the communication port, which provides around 12 volts, though to be exact, it's actually closer to 13 volts. Then, I create a bridge to pin 7. After that, I connect pin 8 and pin 6, where the ground is located to the 12-volt coil of a 
230 volt relay. From here, I run the phase of the consumer device through the relay, and it's switched on or off based on the behavior of the dry contact, which is controlled by pins 7 and 8. So, when the inverter, either through manual activation or based on the conditions we've previously set in the dry contact settings, connects pins 7 and 8, which represent the potential free contact, a small current of about 12 volts flows to the relay's coil, causing it to engage. As a result, the consumer device, whose phase is routed through the relay, receives power. If that device happens to be a heating element, it will start heating up accordingly. But once the function is turned off, or the contact is automatically open based on those predefined criteria, the current to the relay's coil is interrupted, and the connected consumer device will stop receiving power and shut off. That's the theory behind how this whole setup works. It's relatively simple, but as with most things, it can get a bit more complicated in practice depending on the specific circumstances you're dealing with. In practice, here's how it works. To automate everything, the first thing we need to do is set a threshold in the settings where the potential free contact should close. Let's say we set it at 1000 watts or 1 kilowatt. The idea is that once 1,000 watts are flowing into the public grid, and this only happens when those 1,000 watts aren't needed for anything else, those watts are considered surplus, and the contact closes. When the contact closes, current flows to the relay coil, which then activates the relay. This allows power to flow to the connected device. For example, if it's a heating element, it will begin heating up right away. The device will keep running as long as the contact remains closed, drawing power until the conditions change and the contact opens again, cutting off the power. Basically, everything works perfectly in theory. But let me share a real-life example with you. This issue happened to Werner, who has a powerful PV system I installed, along with decent battery storage. He uses this storage in the evenings when the sun is down to charge his electric vehicle. He doesn't have a Solax wall box, but a Tesla one, though that doesn't really matter for this situation. For example, he sets a charging limit of 80% on his Tesla. When he plugs in his car after sunset, with the battery at around 60%, the vehicle starts charging at approximately 11 kilowatts from his battery storage, based on his settings. When the car's battery reaches 80%, what happens next? That's the key question. Naturally, as soon as the battery hits that 80% mark, the car stops drawing 11 kilowatts of power almost instantly. The wall box responds immediately by stopping the energy flow from the battery since the car no longer needs it. But the battery storage system itself doesn't adjust that quickly. It takes around 5 seconds to ramp down from 11 kilowatts to about 500 watts, which is still needed for the household. During those few seconds, the extra power has to go somewhere because the car isn't taking it anymore. The household only requires around 500 watts, so there's a lot of surplus energy that needs to be handled. Since the system can't stop the power flow right away, that excess energy flows into the public grid for a short period. This happens until the battery system can fully adjust to the lower demand and reduce its output. So for a few seconds, you'll see that extra energy going into the grid until everything balances out again. The CT clamps now tell the inverter, hey, we have surplus power. Current is flowing through me. Close the potential free contact so that the power doesn't go into the grid, but instead into the boiler. As instructed, the Solax X3 hybrid inverter closes its potential free contact and the boiler is supplied with power for at least as long as the minimum runtime that has been set in the dry contact settings. This happens even though in reality, there is no actual surplus energy available at that moment. This issue was also present with the adapter box G1, which essentially does nothing more than utilize the inverter's potential free contact in the same way. However, with the adapter box G2, which as most of you probably know, doesn't use the potential free contact, but communicates via a Modbus with the inverter, this problem was addressed from the very beginning. A 30-second delay was added to the system to account for this situation. 
What this means is that power must flow continuously into the public grid for a full 30 seconds at the specified threshold level before the system can issue the command to switch. This safeguard was not included in the potential free contact setup. This important delay feature was only quietly integrated into the system with the latest firmware updates. I'm not entirely sure which specific version introduced it, but since then, all of my customers and channel members have reported that this issue no longer affects them. So, who is this type of surplus control best suited for? Generally, it's ideal for anyone wanting to control a single consumer device in a straightforward way when a definable energy surplus is available. It could also be used for multiple devices or even an entire circuit, but it's important to note that all devices will switch on simultaneously. This setup isn't designed for switching devices one by one. If you also have a Solax wall box running alongside, there's no problem. The potential free contact can be used together with a wall box, since it communicates with the inverter via a Modbus using pins 4 and 5, which are not needed for the relay control described earlier. The two systems can operate in parallel without interference. And general, it's perfect for anyone looking to control a single consumer device in a very straightforward and efficient way when there's a clearly defined energy surplus available. You could also use it to control multiple devices or even an entire circuit, but it's important to understand that all the devices will be switched on simultaneously. This approach doesn't allow for staggered or sequential switching, so it's best used when switching everything at once is acceptable. Now, if you're also using a Solax wall box in parallel, there's absolutely no problem with that. The potential free contact can work in tandem with the wall box because the wall box communicates with the inverter via Modbus using pins 4 and 5, which are not involved in controlling the relay as previously explained. This allows both systems to operate smoothly together without any interference. To wrap things up, let me quickly walk you through the key steps for configuring the dry contact settings. By the way, how do you like the new app so far? I'd love to hear your thoughts, so feel free to drop a comment below. Overall, it's all quite self-explanatory, but here's how I do it. First, I click on device at the bottom of the menu bar. This will show you all the devices you've already integrated into the system. Then, you need to select your inverter. Mine, for instance, is named Master Alex. After that, you click on the remote settings button as expected. Once you do that, the familiar settings menu appears. In this case, we head to the standard settings first and then move on to the dry contact settings. The first thing you need to do is choose whether you want to use the potential free contact to turn a unit on or off, or if you're looking to control a consumer device. In this case, we're controlling a consumer device, so we select load management, which essentially means load control. Next, you have the option to either deactivate the potential free contact entirely or set it to manual mode. In manual mode, you can manually open and close the contact, turning it on or off yourself. Alternatively, you can opt for the automatic mode, which is called Smart Save. This allows the system to manage everything automatically based on the settings you've configured. Below that, we enter the threshold in watts that must flow into the public grid for the contact to close, meaning the point at which the consumer device will start receiving power. Underneath that, there are two criteria that define when the contact opens again to shut off the power. The first is grid consumption. That means if the defined amount of power or wattage is being drawn from the grid, the contact will open and the device will turn off. However, for anyone with a storage system, this only happens when the battery is empty or at its SOC minimum. To prevent that from happening, we have a second criterion, which is the SOC minimum at which the contact closes again. Below that, we can set how long the consumer device must be supplied with power at a minimum once it has been turned on. Further down, we can set how long the device is allowed to run in total during the day. And below that, there are two schedules that we can either activate or deactivate. This means that within the set time window, the device will definitely be supplied with power. As I said, the settings are pretty much self-explanatory for anyone. For those who want to use their surplus, for example, just for a hot water tank, it works perfectly fine now.
Personally, I don't use it that way. I do it through Home Assistant, but that's only because, as you might have seen, I don't just have a boiler. Alongside my three-phase buffer storage, I also have three crypto miners running, and so on. But, as I mentioned, the videos about Home Assistant are coming soon, so be sure to look out for those. I want to give a big thank you to all my loyal channel members and everyone who stayed with me until the very end. I truly wish you all a wonderful time until we meet again in the next video.